for you another portion of the Bible this morning to the Acts of the Apostles, the Acts of the Apostles and let me read for you from verse 4 to verse 11 Acts of the Apostles chapter 1 verse 4 to verse 11 the Acts of the Apostles chapter 1 verse 4 to verse 11 you may want to help people beside you or around you who may have difficulty locating this portion of God's Word. Acts chapter 1, reading from verse 4 to, 11, to verse 11. The Holy Bible says, while he was with them, he commanded them not to leave Jerusalem, but to wait for the Father's promise, which he said, you have heard me speak about. For John baptized with water, but you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit in a few days. So, when they had come together, they asked him, Lord, are you restoring the kingdom to Israel at this time? He said to them, It is not for you to know times or periods that the Father has set by his own authority. But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come on you. And you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, in all Judea and Samaria, and to the end of the earth. After he had said this, he was taken up as they were watching, and a cloud took him out of their sight. While he was going, they were gazing into heaven, and suddenly, Two men in white clothes stood by them. They said, Men of Galilee, why do you stand looking up into heaven? This same Jesus, who has been taken from you into heaven, will come in the same way that you have seen him going into heaven. This morning, I call your attention to our sermon text, which is verse 8. But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come on you and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, in all Judea, and Samaria, and to the end of the earth. Now brothers and sisters, this is a very familiar verse. In fact, I have called your attention to this verse rather frequently in the past. And I make it a point, brothers and sisters, to call your attention again and again to return to this verse as we think of the verse and what the verse here tells you about you as a Christian. Now, it has always been my desire whenever I'm overseas to visit churches where God had done a special work in history. And recently, I had the privilege to visit two of such churches. The first, the first church was pastored by a man of God, greatly used by God during the Second World War and the decades following it. That man of God was able to gather thousands of people to listen to the sermons, to listen to the Word of God every week throughout his life as a pastor of that church. In fact, as I was traveling and passing by that church, building brothers and sisters, I could still see the name of that church engraved permanently on the front part of that church building that is there in that city. However, brothers and sisters, it is no longer a place where thousands and thousands attended the meetings and listened to the Word of God. Why? Because the presence of God, the presence of God is no longer found in that place. The second church that I visited was a church pastored by another man of God in the late 1800s. He was like the first church pastor. He was able to gather thousands of people, including members of the British royal family, to hear the word of God being preached by him. However, when the current pastor was called to be the pastor of this church in the 1970s, the church had become less than 100 members. From the thousands and thousands, 
it had gone down in size to less than 100. And when you look at the population at that point in time in the 1970s, you will realize that there were no young people. The 100 or less, they were all mainly old men and old women in the congregation of that church. And so much so, brothers and sisters, that when it was the winter months, they could not even pay for the heating of their worship hall. And then the current pastor had to make the decision to downsize the church hall in order that they could uh, keep everybody warm, especially during the winter months. That was how sad the situation had become. From the days of thousands, they had come down to old men and old women, less than a hundred people, brothers and sisters. Then, God started to work again in that church. And when I visited the church this time round, I could see hundreds and hundreds of people. No longer only old men and old women, but young men and young women. They were the majority in that congregation that was pastored so many years ago by that man greatly used by God. Brothers and sisters, I saw the same wooden pews that people had sat on in the past and right now in the present time. The church was located in the same location and they were using the same buildings. There, the two churches using the same buildings and they even had the same name still being used by them. The difference is this, brothers and sisters, between these two churches. The presence of God in the life and work of the church. A church can be doctrinally pure. But brothers and sisters, there is no sense of God's presence in the midst of that congregation. There is rightly in our time a call to focus on doctrinal purity in the church. But brothers and sisters, there is a need for us also at the very same time to focus on the presence of God in our lives and in our church work as well. And that is the reason why I have called your attention again to this verse found in Acts of the Apostles chapter 1 and verse 8. And we realize here very immediately, I hope, you could see three lessons so clearly presented to you from this verse. The first, brothers and sisters, is that in this verse, you find a commission from our Lord. Look at what He says in this verse as He addresses His people. You will be my witnesses. You will be my witnesses. You find here, brothers and sisters, a commission for Christians. Some would even say, you find here another version of the Great Commission that elsewhere you would find, for example, in Matthew chapter 28. You find here a commission. A commission referred to the former selection of a people to do a special piece of work. That's what a commission is. You are set aside, you are called. For a special task. God has assigned a special work to the Christians, as we find here being told by our Lord Jesus Christ. You find here a formal statement of a command to do something for our Lord Jesus Christ. You find here, brothers and sisters, a special assignment that is given to you if you are a Christian, if you call yourself a Christian, this is the special assignment commission that the Lord Jesus Christ has appointed you. And so, brothers and sisters, you need to be reminded regularly of this. That as a Christian, you have been given a work to do in this world. As long as you live in this world, here is a commission a commission, a special task that God has assigned to you. It is often, brothers and sisters, the failure to do this task that has killed and stopped many congregations 
of our Lord Jesus Christ around the world and throughout history. Once I visited a very famous Reformed church overseas and I came to realize through conversation with the members of that church that that church has embraced the teaching that this commission that you find here in Acts chapter 1 and verse 8 they have come to embrace this thinking that this command is meant for the pastors and missionaries only and it came to the attitude it has nothing to do with me I am only a simple Christian I am not responsible for this task you see the people in that church had excused themselves from this command of our Lord Jesus Christ but I want to impress upon you as I call your attention once again to this verse and I hope that you see the direct call to be a witness for Christ will you brothers and sisters make it your personal work and your personal business in this lifetime to get the gospel message out to your loved ones and your friends Charles Spurgeon the pastor I was referring to in the second church he wrote this he said I wonder how many Christians could have their lives condensed into this short sentence he lived to make Christ known she lived to make Christ known brothers and sisters have you thought about this how would you respond to what Spurgeon asked of you to think about could you say when you come to the end of your life when you are going to leave this world to meet with God could you say that you have lived your life on earth to make Christ known to others have you brothers and sisters since the time you became a Christian have you ever spoken to someone else about the Lord Jesus Christ? Have you, have you invited someone to church with you? Not because you want to help the church, but because of love. You know that all of us will die one day. That this journey is a journey every one of us must make. And you want your friends whom you consider your loved ones to be ready for such a journey. We are told by 1 Peter chapter 3 and verse 15 to be ready at any time to give a defense to anyone who asks you for a reason for the hope that is in you. You are to be ready. You are to be ready, brothers and sisters. People want to talk about the times and the seasons of the second coming of Jesus Christ. Christians like to oh, find themselves talking about this. In fact, someone actually wrote to me recently and said, Pastor, can you recommend some books? I'm so interested, so interested. And when I reply and say, tell me first, have you told somebody recently about the Lord Jesus Christ? The person did not reply to me anymore. Why? Because a person is only interested in times and seasons, the details about the second coming of Jesus Christ. I want you to know, I want you to take note of what is happening. Look at Acts chapter 1 and verse 6. You find that the apostles were also into this. So when they had come together, they asked him, Lord, are you restoring the kingdom to Israel at this time? You see, we had the same kind of interest as human beings. But look at the response of our Lord. Our Lord calls you to focus on this great commission, this task that has been assigned to you, instead of speculating on the details of His second coming. Look at verse 7, He said, It is not for you to know times or periods, that the Father has said by His own authority is not for you to talk about those things. What you can talk about is to spread the gospel, tell others Jesus has come, save them, call them to be saved. And I hope that as you look at this passage of the Bible this morning, you will somehow be stirred in your heart that you have a duty in this life. You need to work you need to do your business. You need to work hard. True, study hard also for those who are students. 
But beyond all these things, brothers and sisters, Almighty God has assigned to His people this special task that in everything we do, we want to advance the gospel. We want to save people. We want to make sure they are ready for this journey out of this world. Whether you want to admit it or not, whether you are willing to think about it or not, it will come. And this is a travel that we must make. And so the second point now I want to draw attention to is found in the same verse, brothers and sisters. You have seen that you are given a commission. Now look at the second thing you learn from this verse. God has given you a commission. It is a commission, a work that is beyond your human ability and gifts and power to do. And so God promised you the power to do it. Look at what it says. But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come on you. God gave you an assignment that is spiritual in nature. It is impossible for one person to try to convince another person about spiritual things. It is impossible to change a person's heart. It is impossible even to know what is truly in a per another person's heart. God alone can do it and God gives you the power to convince people. He says, God promised you the power to do this work. In order to get this task, special task, this commission done effectively, you need spiritual power of the Holy Spirit. There is no power in the church, there is no power in you for this work. It is not about performing miracles. You find some Christians, they are crazy. They go around saying they can raise the dead, they can heal the sick, they can restore people's injury, and then they say they can speak in tongue, and they frighten people. The non-Christians are not convinced. The non-Christians are just laughing. <laughs> Look at all these crazy people. And it is, it is true, they are crazy people. They say they are Christians, and yet they do things that is against logic and against the teaching of the Word of God. The power here is not about miracles. The power here is not about special gifts that God has given to you individually. The power that the Bible here is talking about is the power of the Holy Spirit that comes upon the people when the gospel is preached. This power, brothers and sisters, was present in earlier times as I gave to you the two examples of the two churches. This power was present when the people heard the preaching of a sermon entitled Sinners in the hands of an angry God. The pastor who preached that sermon was actually a man with a pair of very poor eyes, weak eyes and so very bad eyesight. As he was preaching that sermon, he was actually holding his sermon note so near because before the invention of the spectacle, he couldn't see and so he had to bring the, the, his sermon notes that he had written so near to his eyes in order to read, in order to, 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 to know what to say next. And so he was reading, he was reading from, the, from his sermon notes in such a way and hundreds and hundreds of people in the church worshipping with him that day, they were trembling. They actually felt the fire of hell on the pews they were sitting on and again and again they will all look down under the chair to see is there fire under the chair they could literally feel the fire burning and they were trembling as the preacher was telling them that unless they make peace with God they are in great danger because God is angry with them because of their sin that is the power that we need today. The power that stirs people when they hear the word of God being preached. It is not about learning only with their brain, but it is about the responding of the hearts and emotion that when they what they hear from the Bible arrest them, prick them, stirs them, brothers and sisters. That is what the power of the Holy Spirit is all about. 
This was the power, brothers and sisters, that brought tears and repentance upon those who heard the preaching of the Word of God in the days of revivals. You have heard of the time of Jong Sung, how he came from China in the 1930s and 1940s to Southeast Asia. That man of God came with the gospel and when he preached with the power of this power of the Holy Spirit, many people in this part of the world were addicted to opium. They were opium addicts. They found it so hard to escape from that addiction. And yet when this power was preached, brothers and sisters, opium addicts were released from their addiction. Surprisingly, no explanation, no medication. They just willingly give up this addiction and praise to God. They were freed to live a normal life in the service of God. Many Chinese people in those days, they had second wife, third wife, fourth wife, polygamists with many wives. When they heard the preaching of Jong Sung, in the power of the Holy Spirit as we are told here, they were willing to repent of their sins and they returned to their first wife and were faithful to their first wife to the day they died, brothers and sisters. That is the kind of power, the power that rescued people from gambling, the power that rescued people from misery and self-destruction in alcohol consumption and in all sorts of vices that the people were known for. Brothers and sisters, you call yourself a Christian. I ask you this morning, has God released that power in your life? Have you been convicted? Have you been pricked? Have you been stirred? Have you been moved at all? When you have heard how Jesus Christ died on the cross, He came to die. But why? Why must He die? No other religious leader died. Buddha didn't die for people. Muhammad didn't die for people. Why Jesus? Why you Christian keep on saying Jesus died on the cross? It is because the Christian message is this. In order to make peace with God, someone must pay for your sin of rebellion and disobedience. And nobody can die for himself or herself. God has sent His only begotten Son that He should be the one who rescue and save people by giving his life for them in exchange with their, their life, brothers and sisters. And the church today need this power. We need to earnestly beg God that God will give us this promised power if we are to preach the gospel in such ability and effectiveness. We need to pray that God will give us gospel men and gospel women, gospel boys and gospel girls to walk on the earth once again, like in the days we read of in the Acts of the Apostles and in church history, in the great times of spiritual revival. Yes, you must make sure that doctrines are pure. But equally, brothers and sisters, you should make sure that you have this promised power, this promised power to do the work of the commission the Lord Jesus Christ has called you to. Men and women today in the church must be full of the Holy Spirit that we may yearn to do this work effectively. I come to the last point, the third point, brothers and sisters. You have seen in this verse, in Acts chapter 1 and verse 8, you find here a commission. You find here the promised power to do this commission. And now thirdly, brothers and sisters, you find the strategy, the method to do that you are to follow in order to accomplish this commission. It says there that you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, in all Judea and Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. You see, brothers and sisters, Jesus Christ our Lord has assigned you a task and He knows that you cannot do it on your own. You have no ability and so He promised you the power. He empowered you with the Holy Spirit to do the work and now He gives you the method as to how you are to begin and to complete 
this commission that he has assigned you. How you are to begin, how you are to progress and proceed in the completion of this work. The early Christians in the Acts of the Apostles, if you read this book, you realize that they started from their hometown, from their home, from their own family. And then slowly, they reach out to their relatives, their uncles and aunties, their neighbors, and slowly, slowly, they move outward and to the other towns and villages surrounding until they reach the end of the earth. And this task, as it, as it was assigned to the early Christian, they accomplish it, as you read there, how Paul started from Jerusalem and ended with him in Rome, in the Acts of the Apostles, chapter 28, which was at that point in time the heart of the Roman Empire. Today, you are to bring this same message and you are to bring it towards the end of the earth everywhere possible as much as you are able to fulfill it. Now, many people, when they read the Acts of the Apostles, they were puzzled why the early Christians kept to the Jews first before they reach out to the Gentiles. For example, if you look there at the Acts of the Apostles, chapter 11 and verse 19, you will find that we are, you are told that speaking the word to no one except Jews. Why except Jews? Then, if you go to the Acts of the Apostles, chapter 13 and verse 46, it says, it was necessary that the word of God be spoken to you first. You see there, the Jews first. Why the Jews first? Why must they be first? Well, the question is uh, often asked. It is because the Lord Jesus Christ gave this command and this strategy. You begin with the Jews first. Why? Because you start with those who will most likely listen to you and receive you. Often it is easier for you to talk to your family members than to a stranger at an MRT station. More often than not, when you have something important, when you want to discuss, when there is something that you are troubled and you want to talk to somebody, most likely your mother will be the first person you want to talk to. Ma, mama, mama, can I tell you something? I, I need help. And your mother will say, come, 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 sit down. Why? What's, what's troubling you? How can I help you? And you tell, talk to your father, your mother, your brother, sister, your uncle, auntie, your, your, your cousins, and then slowly, slowly, that's often how it starts. Strangely, when you a person says that he or she has become a Christian and get converted, when a person goes home, I owe, they're not talk about, to anybody about this. Isn't there something very wrong about it? I have met with many Christians who have become insurance salesmen and saleswomen. And I often ask them, how did you practice? How come you are so good in selling insurance policy? How did you start? And they will always say, oh, someone recruited me, go through training, explain to me all the policies, and then help me. And then I will go back to my cousins, go back to my uncle and aunties, go back to my brothers and sisters, and try to sell them, talk to them, practice the process of uh, selling insurance and then often I succeeded and slowly with this experience I go out and I talk to my colleagues and my ex-classmates and slowly slowly I become more and more experienced we always begin with the people we know so that we gain experience and then we can talk to others isn't it strange when we come to the things of God we have this thinking better not when I get into trouble. I want to ask you, brothers and sisters, to seriously think about this. Isn't there something strange and contradicting about this matter? I told you before, in Malaysia, some years ago, Pastor Po Hun Singh, Pastor Po Hun Singh, in Kuala Lumpur, printed 10,000 gospel tracts. 10,000 gospel tracts. And for three months, he asked his people every Sunday to go out in groups to the neighboring estates to distribute the 10,000 gospel tracts. And the purpose of the gospel tract was to invite people to come to their gospels 
meeting, the gospel rally that they were organizing. And so they went out week by week, they went out distributing and giving and this and that. And then the gospel, the day for the gospel rally came. Only one person came. And so they were all very curious. At least one person came, very good. Ha! Who gave you the gospel track? Where did you stay? And this girl, 21, 22 years old, told the pastor, Pastor, I came because my brother invited me. Do you get a message? She didn't get a gospel track. A, a stranger did not give her the gospel track. That was not the reason why she came. She came because somebody she loved, somebody she knows who loved her, invited her. And I hope that you will do the same, brothers and sisters. If you really, really love somebody, if you really, really become convinced that that's the only way to save the person from hell, from separation from God, from a hopeless eternity after this world, will you not be moved and stirred? Will you not go and tell somebody? Will you not go and do your best? I told you before this true story of this engineer from Penang in Malaysia. He came to Singapore to work at Jurong East. And then on Sunday, he went to the church and the pastor was convincing everybody in the church to reach out to your moms and dad before they die. We do not know when we're going to die and we do not know whether our father and mother, how long they will live. And he was so convicted. He couldn't sleep that Sunday night. He couldn't sleep. On Monday morning, he called up his office and he said, Excuse me, I need to take emergency leave. And so he was granted the emergency leave. Early in the morning, he drove from Jurong East all the way back to Penang. Nine hours of driving non-stop. When he went into his home, the father and mother were shocked to see the son coming back unannounced. So the mother thought, See, Liao, died. Sure got cancer, sure got serious thing, sure come back and say, lost job, retrench, or I got cancer, I'm gonna die. So the mother, before anything, the mother was already gonna cry. But the son went in and the son knelt down to the father and mother and said, Papa, Mama, I got something to tell you. The mother said, See la, die la, die la, really, I mean you are going, are you going to die? And the son said, No. This is what has happened, Papa, Mama, I want you to believe in Jesus Christ. Because my pastor told me yesterday, I cannot sleep the whole night, I think of you. That you go to hell, separated from God, and no peace and suffering, punished for your sin. Papa, Mama, I love you. Please come, join me and believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. The father had been silent throughout, suddenly opened his mouth, like Chinese father normally be quiet. He says, son, if I mean so much to you that you are willing to drive from Singapore for nine hours straight, come back, just to tell me I must believe in your Jesus or else I will die and die in hell. Son, I will believe in what you say, I will join you because I know you really love me. Beloved brothers and sisters, we ask people to come and believe in Jesus not because we want their money, not because we want the church to have more people. It is because we really believe it is the only way they can have peace with God and they can be ready to leave this world one day. And I hope that you have the same concern for your father and your mother, your brother and your sister, your sons and your daughters. It is easier to witness to someone who has something in common with you, your colleagues. You just imagine this, brothers and sisters. You can go to your office, you can go anywhere in your office if you have the employee pass. You go there, you can go in. If you wait for your pastor, your pastor go down there, cannot go in. Why? I don't have a pass, cannot go in. I cannot talk to anybody in your office. You can. You turn, you go in. And your colleagues, if they were to see me, they'll say, Who are you? I don't know you. 
Well, when they see you, they say, ah, I know you. Ah, let's go and have coffee, have lunch today. And therefore, brothers and sisters, it's easier for you to talk to your friends and your colleagues and your loved ones about the future world, about their soul, about their happiness, about peace with God, brothers and sisters. I was horrified recently, very scared, when I heard a young person in another church telling me that he planned, listen, he planned to stand outside the mosque on Friday after the Friday prayer and distribute gospel track to people coming out of the mosque. And he was actually asking anybody want to join him to do that. I was horrified. You must have also heard of that man in the aeroplane with a guitar strumming and singing loudly and disturbing people who was sleeping with his so-called gospel song and, and annoying so many people. His pastor came out openly and said he was so brave. I ask you, brothers and sisters, you read that in the Bible. You find the Apostle Paul going to an aeroplane and strum a guitar. Did he go to a mosque, go to a temple and go and make noise and disturb peace? It is always people who came after Paul. Paul never go and find problem. Why do you want to have all these things? When you had never seriously talked to your own father and mother, brother and sister, son and daughter about Jesus first. I always don't understand why people want to give thousands of dollars huh, to missionary in Africa when you never even help your own mother, father, uncle, auntie. Why you give money to other people when you never even help your own people? I think you are just being a hypocrite, isn't it? No, brothers and sisters. That is not how the Holy Spirit works and that is not what the power of the Holy Spirit is all about. Look here and be reminded this morning that Jesus Christ has assigned you a special work. It is to be His witnesses. It is to witness. It means to say that you are going to tell people what Jesus has done for you, why you are a Christian, and what it means for to them. And God knows that you have you are a coward if they're not. And that is why in the Acts of the Apostles you find the early Christian asking God for boldness. That when they are given a chance, that they will be bold and brave to be able and be willing and clearly explain to people what it means by becoming a Christian. And he gives you also this. Don't need to stand outside MRT station, don't need to be at a bus stop. Go to people who know you and go to people whom you already know and start there. And I hope that you listen to me this morning that you will participate in a gospel work, that you will feel the power of the Holy Spirit as you do this work and live your life, that you will follow the pattern the Lord Jesus Christ has given you for this work. Thomas Watson, a Puritan, he writes, A person deeply in love cannot keep his thoughts from the object he loves. The reason we think on God no more is because we love Him no more. The reason we think on God no more is because we love Him no more. When I first read this sentence, I found myself close to tears. Is it true about me? The reason we think on God no more is because we love Him no more. What about you brothers and sisters? You have stopped telling people about Him. You have stopped reading the Bible every day. You have become distracted by so many things in this world. You have no time for God. Is it because you think on God no more because you love Him no more? Repent, brothers and sisters. 
come, return to the Lord, and may you find His forgiveness as you begin once again to love the Lord. Let us pray.